So at time of posting, it is March 25th, 2022, which means it is Tolkien Reading Day, and the theme for the year 2022 is love and friendship. So let's annoy some homophobes. If you're new to my channel, I am a traditional storyteller and folklorist. I usually make content about storytelling and Irish folklore, occasionally about my fucked up eye, but today we're talking about Tolkien. Now, there's been a lot of backlash lately to the idea of including queer characters in Amazon's Rings of Power series, which is based on Tolkien's work writing about Middle-earth. A lot of people have been saying that doing this would violate the themes and the, the, the integrity of Tolkien's writing to include something that he never included himself. There have even been some going so far as to say that Tolkien himself would have been opposed to queer relationships and queer people since he was a devout Catholic born in the Victorian era. Now the thing about that is that these people don't seem to be aware that there are many Catholics who are very much in favour of queer relationships. There are many Catholics who are, in fact, queer. They don't seem to realise that while Ireland is considered one of the most Catholic countries in the world, we were also the first country to legalise marriage equality by popular vote. They don't seem to realise that queer people have always existed and while some time periods have been more difficult for us than others, that doesn't mean there have never been people who helped us or agreed with us. That doesn't mean there were some time periods where we were less likely to exist. First, we're going to talk about the subtext and text in Tolkien's work. And then we'll be talking about Tolkien's own beliefs. And we'll start with the central queer romance in Tolkien's work, Frodo and Sam. Now, even in the movies, which have toned things down considerably, Frodo and Sam are constantly physically affectionate with, it, with one another. They are constantly talking about how much they love each other. They are always having these intimate embraces and holding hands and kissing each other on the head all over the place. It's never ending. In the books, oof, it goes a lot further. It goes so much further. At one point, Frodo is in an absolute state of despair. He's certain they're going to fail. He's exhausted. He's worn out. He knows they're going to die. And Sam is described as comforting him with his arms and body. They kiss even more. They're always kissing each other's hands. They're always brushing away each other's tears. Uh, I believe they kiss away each other's tears at one point. You get to hear a lot of Sam's internal monologue and he is always thinking about how much he loves Frodo. He's always thinking about how beautiful he thinks Frodo is. During one of those points where Frodo is so dismayed and Sam is comforting him, Tolkien actually wrote in his notes a line about it, or rather in his letters, I was probably most moved by the scene when Frodo goes to sleep on Sam's breast. And when Sam is fighting the giant spider Shelob over Frodo's comatose body, he is described as a small creature defending its mate. And then there's the parallels between Frodo and Sam's relationship and Beren and Luthien. If you're not familiar with the story of Beren and Luthien, they are, they have their own book, but they're also one of the central stories of the Silmarillion. Beren was a human man, and Luthien was an elf woman. Beren is a much kind of, as a human, he's kind of much lower class than Luthien. So we see that mirrored right away in the class difference between Sam and Frodo. 
Uh, Frodo is a very wealthy hobbit. He's he's very much an upper class hobbit. He's also much more of a fallow hide hobbit. And Sam is much more of a working class hobbit. His his family's quite poor. Uh, he's more of a harfoot. You know? Fallohide and Harfoot are two of the Hobbit ethnicities because there are canonical Hobbit ethnicities. And both couples have to go on an incredibly dangerous quest involving an incredibly powerful artifact. And for both of them, this quest seems utterly hopeless. For Frodo and Sam, it's destroying the ring. For Beren and Luthien, it is retrieving one of the Silmarils from the crown of Morgoth. And Morgoth is Sauron's boss, basically. He is the guy who woke up once more, one morning and thought, you know what, I'll invent evil today. Beren is captured. And Luthien, Luthien finds him. She sings a song which she kind of improvise on, improvises on the spot and she hears Beren respond and that's how she finds him. In the book, The Lord of the Rings, when Frodo is captured in the Orc Tower, Sam improvises a song on the spot, and when Frodo responds, that's how Sam finds him. Now, after retrieving the Silmaril, Beren has his hand, which is holding the Silmaril, bitten off by Karkaroth, the Hound of Morgoth. When they reach Mount Doom and Frodo puts on the ring, that finger is bitten off by Gollum. So the light, the, the, the file of Galadriel that Frodo uses, that Sam uses, is the light of the Silmaril Beren and Luthien stole from Morgoth. As Sam points that out, when they're in the midst of despair, when they think they're all, they're going to die and the quest will fail, Sam points to the star Yarendil, and he says it seemed hopeless for Beren and Luthien, but they succeeded, they were able to do it. And the glass Galadriel gave you is the light of that Silmaril, so it's almost like this is the same story. We're in the same story, it's still going on now. The two stories parallel each other so much that one of the characters points out that they parallel each other. If I had been directing the movie, that scene would have gone like this. The, but that story, it's, it's still happening, Mr. Frodo. We're, we're in it now. This is the same story. It's the same story! And what happened with Beren and Luthien, according to Aragorn anyway, is that some people say they were eventually reunited on the other side of the Sundering Sea, in the Undying Lands in Valinor. When Frodo is sailing away at the end of Lord of the Rings, at the end of the movie, he is going across the Sundering Sea to the Undying Lands in Valinor. And Sam, after his wife dies, also sails across the Sundering Sea to the Undying Lands, to Valinor, and is reunited with Frodo. But one thing it doesn't mention in the movies is that after Frodo, or after Sam rather, marries Rosie Cotton, the two of them move into Bag End with Frodo. The three of them live together. Even when Sam and Rosie start having loads of children, because Bag End is massive. And it's because all three of them understand that Frodo and Sam cannot bear to be separated from one another. There was an epilogue to The Lord of the Rings that never really got finished and wasn't published. Uh, people said it was too sentimental. And in it, we see Sam after Frodo is left. And he loves his wife, he loves his children, but he's got that ache, that, that hollowness from Frodo's absence. As Sam's daughter says it's because he's lost his treasure, referring to Frodo. 
and she directly compares Sam's behaviour in the loss of Frodo to how Celeborn was acting after Galadriel left. Uh, Celeborn, he's the, the husband of Galadriel. She left with Frodo, Celeborn left much later. He did eventually go to the Undying Lands, but at a much later point. But the, my, my, my point here is that Sam's daughter directly compares Sam's sense of loss at Frodo leaving to Celeborn's at his wife leaving. That's really important. Sam Gamgee is a polyamorous bisexual, and if you argue with me about that, you're incorrect. Baron and Luthien, those names are carved on the headstones of Gerard Tolkien and his wife Edith. They are kind of half-based on their relationship together. That is how central these figures are. That Frodo and Sam's story parallels Beren and Luthien so much is unlikely to be a coincidence. <laughs> Especially when we have a second story where an established married couple have the same kind of reuniting uh, reunification in the, in the end of their of their arc and that brings me to the other main queer couple in the lord of the rings legolas and gimli if you've only seen the movies that's fine uh there's not a huge amount of difference between how their relationship develops where it differs is after aragorn's coronation and going into the appendices Legolas and Gimli are completely inseparable. They go everywhere together. They basically start road tripping across Middle Earth. Gimli really wants to see the glittering caves in Rohan. He really wants to show Legolas. Legolas isn't that interested, but he goes to keep Gimli happy and is amazed. He thinks it's amazing. And Gimli establishes a little kingdom there. Then Legolas really wants to go to Fangorn Forest, but Gimli doesn't really care, but he goes to make Legolas happy because Legolas wants to show him and, and Gimli is amazed and he thinks it's great. And they keep doing this. They keep traveling across Middle Earth together until nearly all the elves have left and gone across the Sundering Sea to Valinor. And then Legolas builds a boat and himself and Gimli sail across the Sundering Sea to Valinor. What you have to understand is that even if they just have a close friendship, everything they're doing is violating social norms. In that period in Middle-earth's history, there was immense distrust between elves and dwarves. They did not like each other. So them having even a close friendship, let alone a romantic relationship, would have been violating social norms. But more than that, only elves are really allowed to go to Valinor, and there's only two exceptions to that. Beren, because of how much himself and Luthien were in love, and ring bearers, people who had born the One Ring. Now being a ring bearer might explain how Sam got in, because he was technically one, even if only for a few days or a few hours. But it doesn't explain Gimli. Only two things explain Gimli. One is that they waited until there was no one left in Middle-earth to stop them. Which is hilarious. Um, and two is that it was a barren exception. It was that they were so in love that Aru Iluvatar, the creator of the world they live in, God, essentially, decided to make an exception for them like he did with Baron. Because Gimli, he was never a ring bearer. And that's the only other exception. And even then, even without that, Gimli leaves his family, his friends, and his species to be with Legolas forever. I think the story of Sam and Frodo 
I think that's kind of a story of the reality of what queer relationships could be like at the time. And then the story of Legolas and Gimli was a story of what they could be like in a fantasy. The fantasy of what queer relationships should be. That they were doing all these things against the so social norms, they were, they were getting to be together and they weren't having to be separated. They weren't having to have that period away from each other. Non-fellowship characters. Now this is going to be a little bit shorter. Eowyn. Faramir directly compares Eowyn's feelings for Aragorn to the feelings soldiers sometimes develop for their officers, their captains. And the thing about that is that this did sometimes lead to queer relationships. It is a thing that would happen and within the context of the Lord of the Rings that would have almost exclusively been male soldiers and male captains, male officers. So that seems to be directly comparing a woman's feelings for a man to a man's feelings for a man. Later, uh, Gandalf is talking to Eomer about Eowyn and says that though she is born in the body of a maid, had a spirit and courage at least the match of yours. This could be read as an indicator that Eowyn is intended as trans. It sounds a lot like the way people used to describe trans people being born in the wrong body. And that one's that one's more open to interpretation than the rest of it. I, I'll we, we can go in and out on that one. But what I think is fairly unambiguous, and where I will not be accepting any argument, is Bilbo Baggins. There is no heterosexual explanation on this earth or any other for Bilbo Baggins. Here are a couple of direct quotes about Bilbo Baggins. Bilbo and Frodo were, as bachelors, very exceptional. Note, confirmed bachelor is a euphemism for uh, a queer man. Bag End is a queer place and its folk are queerer. We all know that queer is used for referring to the queer community, but it has been a euphemism for that for a very long time. Certainly within Tolkien's lifetime. Bilbo wanted to remain unattached for some reason he did not understand himself or would not acknowledge, for it alarmed him. Bilbo had whole rooms devoted to clothes. And Bilbo, fucking hobbits, Bilbo in Rivendell composed a Gilbert and Sullivan show tune in Rivendell. He writes a song about Yarendil. Yarendil being Elrond's father, by the way. And it is to the tune of Modern Major General. A rental was a mariner that tarried in a very and he built a boat of timber fell in limber thousand journey in. <sighs> Hobbits. This is a confirmed bachelor who remains unattached for reasons that alarm him, with whole rooms devoted to clothes, and writes Gilbert and Sullivan show tunes. Bilbo Baggins could not be more of a stereotype if he were a drag queen. Speaking of drag queens, by the way, by the way, Smaug. Smaug the Magnificent, with the fucking bedazzled chest. The, the <laughs> sleeping on a pile of gold. You may not be familiar with the bedazzled chest if you've only seen the movies. In the book. <laughs> In the book, because of sleeping on the pile of treasure, his chest is encrusted in jewels and gold. It's referred to as a bejeweled waistcoat. And Smaug is very proud of it. He thinks it's amazing. He thinks he's gorgeous. 
and he shows off about it and Bilbo compliments on it. Actually, you, you know in Moana that the crab, that Smaug, that Smaug, you could do the whole song shiny and it'd be about Smaug. Smaug is the reason why I think non-binary drag performers shouldn't be called drag kings or drag queens, they should be called dragons. Smaug is the reason... <laughs> Smaug is a magnificent queen. <laughs> <laughs> Smaug refers to himself as Smaug the Magnificent. If that is not a queer-coded villain, I do not know what is. Going off the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, the final one I'd like to reference is Turin Turambar from the Children of Hurin. His story also features in the Silmarillion. Turin Turambar strips a man naked and chases him through the woods while prodding him up the arse with a sword. At one point later in the book, himself, he, he's, he's, he's leading a gang of bandits living up in the mountains and his friend Beleg Strombo comes and finds him and the bandits are very jealous and very suspicious because they think these two have arranged some secret tryst. The word tryst is the word that's used. There is no interpretation of that line that does not imply that his gang thinks these two are gay. They're, 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 it's, it's fairly explicit that the gang thinks these two are gay. I got tired and decided to finish filming on another day. Okay, so we're going to go into Tolkien's personal life and how he likely felt about the queer community. We are going to acknowledge that the period in which Tolkien lived was even more dangerous for the queer community than the period we live in today. We will acknowledge that. And Tolkien acknowledges that. He tells us about how once C.S. Lewis received a letter from a male homosexual, but of course it was the sort of letter one takes care to destroy. Now there could be two reasons why you would destroy such a letter. One would be that you're utterly disgusted by it, that you're, you're a Puritan, that you're a Victorian Catholic who is, finds this idea obscene and, and sinful. And the other is that this was a period where homosexuality was illegal and, and punishable and that you didn't want incriminating evidence to exist, so you would burn it. And I think the second interpretation is more likely, given Tolkien's friend groups. Tolkien was very good friends with W.H. Auden was an openly gay poet. And one of the members of the Inklings, uh, a writing circle and social group founded by Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, was separated from his wife and lived a quietly homosexual life. Tolkien's former student and eventual friend, Mary Renault, was an open lesbian. She lived with her wife for most of her life. Well, not wife. Life partner for most of her life. And... <laughs> she was kind of a gay icon because of how much she wrote about homoerotic and homoromantic subtext in Greek myth. And that work is something that Tolkien said he was deeply engaged in. And lastly, when Tolkien was very young, uh, in his, in his, around about his 20s, it was during World War One. he had a friend named Geoffrey Bach Smith. He was a poet and a soldier. Much of his work is thought of to be homo-romantic in the modern day. He died uh, during World War I and Tolkien was devastated. 
by this. Um, he mourned it pretty much the rest of his life. And in the year or so following Geoffrey's death, Tolkien collected up all of his poetry, everything he could find, edited it, compiled it, and had it published. Not that different to Sam after Frodo left Middle-earth, taking his notes and taking his book and finishing that book. A Geoffrey Shortly before he died, he wrote a letter to Tolkien. He was expecting to die soon. And in the letter, this is just one quotation from it, he said, My dear John Ronald, may you say things I have tried to say long after I am not there to say them. From a poet whose work is considered homo-romantic, to a man who had a very queer friend group and who found the work of a lesbian talking about queer subtext in Greek myth deeply engaging. May you say things I have tried to say long after I am not there to say them. People talk a lot about how some of the characters in Tolkien's work are beaming wife guys, I believe is the phrase used. Uh, Tom Bombadil is an excellent example. So is Sam Gamgee, the way he talks about Rosie Cotton. Um, and yes, uh, Tolkien was likely writing from experience there. He was a beaming wife guy. He loved his wife Edith an incredible amount, so much that he made the romance based on their relationship into the central core of the universe he created. That's... That, <laughs> that's ridiculous. That's amazing. Um, but they also talk, people also talk, about the air of quiet bisexual yearning in Tolkien's work. And that rings true in the same way that the beaming wife guy stuff does. It, it, it feels, it has the same genuineness to it. It has the same heartfeltness to it. Sam married Rosie Cotton and he loved Rosie. And then when Rosie was gone, he went and he rejoined Frodo. I have to feel that, like, maybe Sam and Frodo reuniting was Tolkien and Geoffrey reuniting, even though he did love Edith. I think Tolkien was bisexual. That's what I'm saying. Tolkien was bisexual and he was in love with both of them. Um, now, I'm not saying this as a categorical fact. This is my interpretation of the information laid out before me. And I am willing, totally willing, to entertain that maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was just straight and a very good ally. Totally grand. Cool. Willing to argue that. I am not willing to entertain the idea that he was a homophobe, disgusted by homosexuality, purely because he was a Victorian-era Catholic. That is not good evidence, especially not when presented with all of this. With the people he loved, the people who were in his life, and I mean even platonically loved. The, 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 the work he engaged with, the, the actions he took, the things he said, do not communicate homophobia. They communicate, at the very least, an acceptance of gay people. I don't know if he interacted much with the trans community. I don't know how much he knew about the trans community. I'm certain he knew they existed, because there were articles at the time, news stories about 
uh, soldiers who came home and transitioned and that kind of thing. But for the gay community, at least, Tolkien clearly had some sympathy. At least sympathy, if not... If not that he was a member of that community! Um, and so, I think it's very likely that there is queer subtext, and in the case of Turin Turambar, flat out text in his writing. And people also say that there's no sexual content in Tolkien's work, and therefore there can't be any queer content. And, like, first of all, that first part's not true. It's just that it's all in the Children of Hurin. Um, like, in the Children of Hurin, you have rape, you have incest, um, you have, you've, you've got all kinds of stuff. There, in fact, if you wanted to make a, a Game of Thrones but tolkien -y show, it would be Children of Hurin that you made it about, because that's where all that stuff happens. One of my favorite bits is Turin decapitates a rapist and then turns around and says, if anyone has a problem with that, you're next. That's fucking great. Um, it's also the book in which we have the most blatant queer imagery, uh, queer subtext, and the, 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 like... The open acknowledgement of queer people in, like, it's it's a very small thing, but it is still there in Turin's gang thinking him and Belleg had arranged a tryst. That is a small but explicit acknowledgement of the queer community right there. But even ignoring the children of Hurin, there's no acknowledgement of sexuality in straight couples either, really. Um, not any more than there would be. In fact, there's more affection shown between people of the same sex than there is between men and women in Tolkien's work. There is so much more physical affection shown. Anyway, in conclusion, <laughs> the arguments against queer subtext in Tolkien's work basically amounts to Victorian Catholic wah-wah-wah, whereas the arguments in favour, it's the people he chose to associate with, it's the work he found engaging, it's the actions he took, it's the things he said, it's his closest relationships, it's his life. His life is the argument in favour. His work is the argument in favour. And that's put up entirely against his religion and the period in which he lived. I'm sorry, but that's not a convincing argument. <laughs>